All right. So I want to start out talking about the book of Job first, because I think a lot of people, both believers and unbelievers, struggle with the issue of suffering and injustice in the world, you know, understandably so. And your lectures on the book of Job are so profound and insightful on this topic, even though, as you acknowledge, the book of Job doesn't give an answer for why suffering and injustice exists. But I still find the book profound and even comforting. And in fact, um, I have a dear friend who made a lot of, let's just say he made significant sacrifices in his personal life to go into the ministry and to serve God. And his only expectation was that God keep his mother and his sister around and keep them close to him. And long story short, they both ended up passing in a relatively short period of time. And so he struggled with this. Uh, like Job, he was, I guess you could say, angry with God. And I suspected that he was framing his worldview according to the retribution principle, right? That God blesses the righteous and, you know, curses the wicked. And so I sent him your lecture on Job and it completely, you know, allowed him to move on and reconcile things. So I just wanted to share that story with you. Well, um, thank you. That's that's very encouraging. Yeah. No, thank you. It's your lectures are just they're so awesome. I, I enjoyed them so much. Um, OK, so can I think a good way to start out would be can you take like I know it's a big ask, but maybe 10, 15 minutes and just uh, <laughs> talk about the book of Job, what it's trying to accomplish and how it's trying to change our way of thinking about God and suffering. Thanks. Yeah, um, the I think one of the best ways that we can approach that question is to talk about, first of all, some of the things that it doesn't do, uh, because many readers come into the book with presuppositions and ideas about what they think the book is. And then they get to the end of the book and they say, what? Uh, wait, you, you, didn't, you didn't give me a very good answer to my question. And that's because it was your question, not the book's question. <laughs> so I think one of the ways we can approach that is uh, there are six keys that I identify uh, that kind of put us on a, the path of reading the book well. Uh, the first one is I say that Job is not on trial. He has trials. He thinks he's on trial. His friends think he's on trial, but he's not. And so the book is, is going a different direction. Uh, and it's really subverting what Job himself would have thought. Second one is that we have to recognize that the book is more about God than it is about Job. We don't receive our lessons, our biblical, scriptural lessons from the book from Job's mouth. We receive it from God and from what the narrator has to tell us about God. So we're supposed to learn about God, not supposed to learn about Job. Job is not there as someone that we are supposed to imitate or someone that we're supposed to learn from. He's wrong. He's not wrong in the same way his friends are, but he's wrong and God corrects him. So we have to be careful that we don't think that we're learning the lessons from Job. Third, uh, we often go to the book thinking that it's going to help defend, define God's justice, uh, explain it. And what I found is the book is less about his justice and more about his wisdom. That it's not there to try to create, present a theodicy to explain how you can defend that a just God could do things like this. It's rather so that it can present his wisdom so that you trust him even when you don't understand. So it's more about his wisdom than his justice. That's number three. Number four, it's not a book that's trying to tell us how to think about suffering. Uh, my understanding of the book of Job is that it's trying to help us to know how to think about God when we are suffering. Um, it's not going to explain suffering for us. It's not going to give a defense of why is it that good people suffer. Um, so even though it gives us some pause for thought about suffering, and how we can think about it. In the end, the way we think about it is to understand how we need to think about God. Number five, and this is something I've alluded to already, 
uh, I don't think the book is here to give us answers of all the things we want to know about God and his work in the world, about suffering and why it happens, about why righteous people suffer. It's not to give us answers. It's more about helping us to embrace trust. That is, it wants us to trust God, even when we don't have the answers. One of my little sound bites that I like to use is that trust steps in where explanations fail, mm. where answers are not forthcoming. That's where trust is, that's, that's its environment where it works. And so the book wants to guide us to trust rather than to give us answers. And finally, number six uh, is that the book is not trying to tell us why we suffer but rather is asking the question, what constitutes righteousness? Now, remember the whole book leads off with the question, does Job serve God for nothing? The challenger doesn't say, well, no, Job's not really righteous. That doesn't happen. He affirms Job's righteousness. His question is, what's Job's motivation for being right. righteous? Is he only serving God because um, he he gets blessings, benefits, mm -hmm. prosperity? Is he only serving God because he's afraid of the consequences if he doesn't? Is he only serving God because he believes that God is petty and will strike out, lash out at any slight infraction? Or is he really serving God because it's the right thing to do? And so this is actually more of an examination of what constitutes righteousness rather than examination of why we suffer. The suffering, as prominent as it is in the book, is only there to be a test case of righteousness. How does one discern if someone is serving God only for what they get out of it? Well, you have to take away everything they get out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so suffering becomes the necessary element in the test case to figure out what Job's righteousness is all about. And in that sense, I think that the book is much more interested in us coming out of the reading and saying, now I know where I suffer, why I suffer. No, not that. Instead, it wants us to ask, what drives my righteousness? What drives my fear of God? Is, is it because I stand to gain? I hope to gain some benefit? Or will my righteousness really stand up to the tests, even of significant suffering? Mm -hmm. So it's trying to give us a way to think through what drives us to be people of God. And so I guess that would be my overview of what it's trying to accomplish. Okay. It's trying to get us to think about righteousness. And it is trying to change our way of thinking about God uh, to move from a, a posture of critique and why, why, why? Right to move from there to a posture of trust. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what you call the triangle of claims that you have yeah. God's justice, Job's righteousness, and then the retribution principle that God blesses the righteous, curses the, you know, the wicked. Yeah. And how the book of Job is trying to uh, push back against the retribution principle way of thinking. Yes, it truly is subversive with regard to the retribution principle. So the triangle of claims, as you said, has the three angles of the triangle representing God's righteousness. I'm sorry, God's justice, Job's righteousness, and the retribution principle. In Job's former life, the way the book starts, the triangle is, is comfortable and it holds together. It's logical. It reflects experience. Mm -hmm. Job is prospering and uh, in his... Uh, righteousness and God is viewed as just and the retribution principle is viewed as true. When Job begins suffering, 
then you run into problems. And by the way, this whole triangle idea was developed by Matityahu Tzavat, who was one of my professors at Hebrew Union College. And I took a course on Job from him. And he's got an article called The Meaning of the Book of Job. So this triangle idea is developed from sort of what he began. So when Job begins suffering, the question is, um, how is that triangle going to be approached? How are you going to think about it? Mm -hmm. And the basic approach is that um, once Job starts suffering, you have to figure out what what angle of the triangle you're going to camp in, defend, <laughs> and then which of the other two angles is going to go, because you mm -hmm. can't hold on to all three of them. And so we find that Job's friends uh, decide that they're going to camp out on the retribution principle. They defend that, they embrace it, they don't question it. And so then they've got to decide, does that mean that God is not just or that Job is not righteous? And they're not willing to accept that God is not just. And so all of their barbs are focused on Job, that his righteousness is not all that they might have assumed that it was or that he claims that it was. They have to give up something. The triangle's collapsing. And so that's the one they give up. Job, of course, uh, defends his own righteousness. So he's camped firmly in that corner of the triangle. And so he looks out at the other two, God's justice and the retribution principle, what's going to give. He actually spends a lot of time trying to deconstruct the retribution principle, but he just can't make it work. And that means that he's left with that awkward <laughs> position of saying the justice of God is the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the one he gives up on. Elihu, the, the later friend that comes in the later chapters of the book, actually takes a different position from both Job and his other friends. Uh, Elihu certainly builds his camp, builds his fort on the justice of God, and that's what he talks about all the time. So he looks at the other two, Job's righteousness and the retribution principle, and he basically tries to find a way to embrace or question both of them. Actually, it's more like questioning both of them. So he expands the idea of retribution principle from being something remedial to be something preventative. And he also restructures the question about Job's righteousness to say this isn't about Job's past. It's about what Job is doing now. We might not be able to identify an offense in Job's past. But what he is doing now is criminal. He's, he's uh, exercising his own self-righteousness as a weapon against God. Mm. So Elihu takes a, a, a different position. And so that's how the, the book kind of proceeds as it explores how each one reacts to the issues on the table. Uh, but it all operates within the assumption of the triangle, okay? Mm -hmm. Which again has the retribution principle as a major part of it.